And turn with me, please, in your copies of God's Word to Daniel chapter 10. Now, Daniel chapter 10 is found on eight, page 895 in the Bibles provided. Daniel chapter 10. Uh, these uh, last three chapters of Daniel are all part of one uh, extended vision. And uh, this, this evening we're going to look at the introduction to it. Uh, here, just this chapter, Daniel chapter 10. And in this book, we've seen how the visions given to pagan kings often brought about a response from those pagan kings. And it was, it was often a response of terror. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar couldn't sleep. Belshazzar's knees were knocking. And uh, while we have had some glimpses of how these visions affected Daniel, I mean, he wouldn't wish them on his enemies. Uh, overall, though, Daniel has seemed composed through the various visions we've seen. But the passage before us shows us for him, what was for him a per- particularly uh, uh, afflicting vision. A vision that really rocked him to his core. So let's hear now Daniel chapter 10. This is the word of our God. Let's hear him. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. And the word was true. It was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his voice, the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel alone, saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone, and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I was left there with the kings of Persia, and I came to make you understand what is to happen in your days, sorry, what is to happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision is for days yet to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I I said to him who stood before me, O my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and, and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, 
your prince. So ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray for his blessing upon it. Oh Lord, we are on holy ground. Lord, help us to remove our sandals. Help us to remember how holy and righteous and glorious you are. Lord, teach us from this your word. Lord, guide our eyes to see you, your glory in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now you know, and knowing is half the battle, G.I. Joe. That's, that's a phrase that was on a TV. I think they had a few spots they were trying to get across. The part of a battle is knowing. Part of it is getting true information to the people who need to believe the truth. And sometimes it is subterfuge. It is not it is preventing those who are your enemies from knowing the truth. A big part of any battle is knowing the truth. Now you know, and knowing is half the battle. But friends, there's another part of knowing that is a part of the battle. And that's not just the who's maybe working at trying to help the right knowledge get to the right people or prevent the, 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 the knowledge from getting to the wrong people. There, there's, there are those external things. There are those uh, uh, attempts of people to control knowledge. But there's an entirely different part of knowing that has to do with our own selves. It has to do with our ability to receive the truth as it comes to us. There are some things that to us just seem unbelievable. There are some things to us that uh, are hard to receive. And even if we may want to know the truth, they're hard for us to know. This passage deals with that latter part of knowing, that latter part of the battle that is sometimes battling with our own flesh to receive the knowledge that he has given us. Such is the battle that Daniel had in this passage. We see him alarmed. We see this affects him viscerally. And that's going to be used, I trust, by God tonight to make us wrestle all the more with what he saw, with the God who is. And do we want to receive? Will we receive this revelation? Will we receive this God? And so that's with that caution that we enter this passage, knowing that knowing itself is a battle. But first, what is this about? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the rest of this book is an extended vision that Daniel had. Uh, what I just read was the opening of it. Uh, Daniel is living uh, at this point during the reign of Cyrus of Persia. Notice, of Persia. Uh, this would mean that this occurred late in Daniel's life. This would mean at this point in time he, is out, he has outlived the Babylonian Empire. Uh, and the setting for this vision, verse 4, is the Tigris River. Um, this, is, this means perhaps he's been relocated with the rise of this new empire, uh, perhaps as one who worked in the government of Babylon. He's now working in the Persian government in some capacity. He's been, uh, he's been, tra he's been moved there. Uh, or, or perhaps this is just part of the vision that's, uh, that's helping him to see a, a setting for uh, what he's intended to receive here. Uh, and Daniel, uh, the, the part, another part of the context here is that Daniel has been praying intently leading up to this vision. It's likely that he's been considering the previous visions that he's had, and he's had them over a number of, of years. Uh, we've seen during various reigns of different pagan kings, he's had uh, these visions, and, and, and here he's, 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 even before the vision begins, he's wrestling. He's wrestling to understand. Verse 2, he's been mourning for three weeks. Notice he's, he's fasting. He particularly refrains from delicacies, from meat and wine. Now, even as you mentioned, Daniel not eating meat and wine, what does that, what does that remind you of? It actually brings us back to the first chapter. 
In the first chapter, it was a, a pagan king who was telling Daniel, you can't have this meat, or, or you should have this meat and wine, and, and Daniel and his friends taking a stand. We're not going to have it. Here, likewise, Daniel is taking a stand. Not because there's a king necessarily forcing these things down his throat, but because he knows how greatly he needs to, to seek the Lord. He's fasting. He's not anointing himself. He's humbling himself, verse 12, which we should understand he's seeking the Lord in prayer. Fasting and prayer are things that go together in the scriptures. So it's not just he's doing the one. He, he's using this to seek the Lord. And while we won't, won't get to the content of the, this vision, i.e. I, what happens in chapter 11 and chapter 12, we're not going to get to that yet, yet in this sermon. We are told a bit about, about that. What's this about? Uh, the man in linen introducing this vision tells Daniel, verse 14, he is to understand it by what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. Which tells us that the bulk of this, the content of this, uh, is, is going to be things that are prophecy. There are things yet to come. This is God revealing beforehand what will happen. And friends, let's be reminded that that's only possible because God is God. God is the one who controls all things. All things are under his sovereign power. And so he, of all people, he's able to say, well, this is going to happen years from now. And when he says that, we can trust him. God can prophesy. God can tell those things which are to come because he is in complete control. Can you imagine if God were not in control and he were to say, this is going to happen 100 years from now? Well, that would be a guess for God. And yet that's not the God that's here in the scriptures. He's saying because he knows. He's revealing. Uh, and also we see uh, he's told uh, to not seal up the vision, or sorry, he is told to seal up the vision, or rather he was told that in chapter 8, verse 26. Again, uh, this one is for days yet to come. That is to say, this would not soon take place. And in our study uh, there in chapter 8, we learned that God could foretell kings and kingdoms, even in great detail. And we're going to see a number of details in chapter 11, and next, next week, Lord willing, uh, that those who would live in such times would be comforted. Uh, well, here in this passage, that would be the case too. Uh, this is for days yet to come. Um, and notice what Daniel says of it, uh, verse 1, the word was true and it was great conflict. That is the word. The revelation was great conflict, or, or the word here can be warfare, struggling, which could be referring to the things we'll see, or sorry, sorry, the things that Daniel saw next chapter. Again, tremendous detail about kings that will reign during the intertestamental period, a period of suffering for the people of God. Or it could be referring to the trauma of receiving this revelation. And we should recognize that revelation can be alarming. Revelation itself can be traumatic. As I mentioned in the introduction, we know a great deal of Daniel's response to this vision. And yet we get a glimpse of, 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 of others' uh, response, uh, even though they didn't even get to see it. Verse 7, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. Friends, think about this. There are some things that God in revealing were so terrifying that people would flee so that they wouldn't even see it. So terrifying that they ran for their lives. Now, Daniel did stay. Daniel did receive this vision, and, and God has prepared him for this. Think of all the visions that he's seen so far throughout his life recorded in this book. God has been preparing for him for this. Uh, and... And yet Daniel himself wasn't unaffected. Verse 8, no strength was left in, in me. I retained no strength. Now, indeed, part of that may refer to the fact that uh, he has been uh, fasting. He has been, uh, been afflicting himself in order to seek the Lord more. But I, I don't think that's what he's communicating here. He's really saying it's the vision that did this to him. It was traumatic for him. It affected him, affected him physically, it affected his appearance. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed. Have you ever seen the blood flow from someone's face? Have you ever seen someone physically affected and they're growing pale right before your eyes? Uh, and it would appear that he fainted, verse 9. 
Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my eyes, with my face to the ground. Now, yes, uh, God does bring his enemies to, to lick the dust, but often just the, the, the striking of, of, of fear when we experience God drives our face to the ground. And, and even when he is returned to his consciousness, he can't return to his feet right away. Verse 10, he's trembling on hands and knees. Uh, only once he is given some words of reassurance. Only once he's given some re- words of reassurance does he stand up, and he's still trembling. Even as he continues listening, he's struck dumb. Verse 15, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. His lips had to be touched so that he could speak again. And even as he speaks, he says, there's no breath left in me. Friends, do we ever consider the trauma of receiving God's revelation? Do we ever think about what it took for the prophets of old to receive visions and and to, to really experience God? And friends, all the more, this should make us thankful that God did bring those who came before us to to know him, but this also, uh, it should do something to us too. We are being brought to know this same God. Now, some of you, I know, as I've spoken about how this afflicted Daniel and how this bodily affected him, you're, you're, you're asking right away, well, what did he see? But that's part of the point. We need to recognize that receiving this revelation was traumatic. For instance, there there are many people today who say say things like, well, why doesn't God just talk to me? I kind of want to smack those people upside the head and say, do you even know what you're talking about? When God did speak to his people, it was something like this. Or or when God revealed himself to his people at Sinai, we talked about it this morning in the the Ten Commandments class. When God spoke with his people from Sinai, they begged him, do not let God speak to us lest we die. And if we're not affected by that, I don't think we're ready to deal with God's revelation. If your appetite isn't affected, if you aren't in some way touched by this, I don't think you're really coming to grips with what Daniel saw. And so that said, let's, let's do walk through this vision, or at least this introduction to this vision, and we will in, coming, in the next few weeks look at the rest of this vision, the content of it in coming sermons. And first, in this introduction, Daniel saw Jesus. And so let's look at Jesus. This is who I take this man in linen to be. And I do so as there are many parallels between this passage and Revelation chapter 1, including that uh, uh, just as this is the introduction to the the, the crux of the the, the content of the vision, which is going to follow in the following chapters, so you have in Revelation 1 this, this image of Jesus that then introduces the whole of the book of Revelation. That's a parallel just in the structure of the two, but also notice the, 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 the description of this man. Here he's clothed in linen. That's like the Son of Man clothed with a long robe in Revelation. A fine belt of gold from a faz around his waist, like, like a golden sash around the chest of him in Revelation 1. His face was like the appearance of lightning, which is like the one whose whose face shone like the sun in full strength. Uh, His eyes are like flaming torches, uh, eyes like a flame of fire, Uh, arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze. Uh, Revelation 1 says his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in in a furnace. That man from Revelation 1, let me remind you, is obviously Jesus. He is the first and the last. He's the one who died and is alive forevermore. And so I take this man clothed in linen to be a same, a a vision uh, of Jesus. That is is a a, a symbol, a picture of him and his glory. And yet it's not only for the similarities in the appearance of these two, but also in the responses that both elicit. Again, Daniel fell down before him in a faint. 
When John saw that, that man, saw Jesus uh, in Revelation 1, he fell on his face as though dead. And to both, uh, a hand touched them. To both, it was said, fear not. Now, why am I hammering this point? It's Jesus. <laughs> well, that's because some object. Some say Daniel couldn't have seen Jesus because Jesus wasn't yet incarnate. Well, that's true. But remember that John wasn't seeing Jesus incarnate either, in the sense that that vision of Jesus was a picture of reality. It wasn't reality itself. Uh, Jesus wasn't incarnated with bronze feet or a face like the sun. Uh, that, that is to say that Jesus, when he was incarnated, took on our flesh, our nature. He was so fully human that he could save men fully. He had to be fully man. In fact, if he if he was incarnated with, without real human feet, we, we would have real questions of, can, can he resurrect our feet? Can he save us in, in our full nature if he doesn't have a full human nature? And yet John was seeing a depiction of Jesus. He was seeing a, a picture of Jesus in his glory. So why can't Daniel see a, a picture of Christ who was yet to come here? Still others might object further that whomever Daniel sees must not be Jesus because verse 13, he seems to need help. That is, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Or verse 21, none contends by my side except Michael, your prince. <coughs> so they'd say it can't be Jesus because Jesus being God doesn't need help. And to that I say, well, well, you got, you got to have it one of both ways. You're either saying this can't be Jesus because Jesus wasn't yet incarnate, or this can't be Jesus because Jesus really was incarnate. And, and as Jesus really was incarnate in his humanity, as regards his human nature, which he retains forever, he will need help. There are things that are appropriate to his human nature that he will rely on others uh, to participate in. Now, this is an appropriate de depiction, I think, of the God-man in both places, Revelation 1 and here. Then lastly, I'll say, if this is not Jesus, who is it? How many linen-wearing, flame-eyed men of glory does God have? And I think it is a real problem. If this is not Jesus, and that image is so clearly Jesus in Revelation 1, who is this? So all that to say, I think we're on good ground here to say Daniel saw a depiction of Jesus. And this is where I want to point out to you that that itself was the first part of the trauma. Those others with, with Daniel, they didn't see this. They, they were terrified. What I'm telling you is that even when you come close to seeing a Jesus like this, you must be an utterly in awe. Or like Isaiah, Isaiah 6, 5, when the glory of the Lord filled the temple, he, he, he said, woe is me, I, I am a man of unclean lips. Or when Peter, uh, Peter, really, it was just, he caught a bunch of fish, but it was obvious that Jesus had done this in his, in his power as the Lord uh, who controls the seas and the land. Peter would say, depart from me, Luke 5, 8, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. When you really encounter Jesus and you know him for who he is, you know him to be the, the glorious Lord, it affects you. And I need to say this because there is a growing casualness in evangelicalism. People are casual with Jesus. And a commentator illustrated this with a story. There was a man who came to John MacArthur. John MacArthur's a pastor. Um, and the man says, you know, I spend with Je time with Jesus all the time. You know, sometimes I, I'm shaving and Jesus comes to me and we chat. And John MacArthur asks a penetrating but appropriate question. Do you stop shaving? This is really Jesus. If this is really the same one that Daniel saw, that John saw, that, that does not leave us unchanged. He is awesome. That is, if you really know him for who he is. Dear children of this congregation, I want you to hear this. I know you've grown up 
hearing about Jesus, uh, and he's surely been the answer to every Sunday school question. Uh, you know him as a friend, and, 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 and dear ones, he is a friend of sinners. You, you know him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and indeed, he is, but he is also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the glorious Lord. He has eyes like a flame of fire. His face shines like the sun. Do you tremble before him as much as you delight and then take refuge in him? It is appropriate for us to fall down on our faces before him. We should be struck with awe just to be in his presence. Oh, that we knew the holiness and glory of Jesus more. But there is a second part of the vision before us. Now, Daniel also may have, that may have also alarmed Daniel, and that is the aspect introduced here of spiritual conflict. I want you to know about spiritual conflict. He says, and I'll, I'll read a larger, or two verses here, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, verse, this is verse 12, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. Now let's remember the con context of this vision is that Daniel had been fasting. He'd been praying for three weeks. And yet this, this man in the vision comes describing to him that it's during that same time, three weeks is 21 days, three weeks, 21 days, that there was this spiritual battle going on and that he's coming to him because of your words. It's connected to this prayer. Now let's, not, let's talk now about that, uh, that, that battle that's going on, why he needed the help of Michael. Uh, this man in linen was fighting with the prince of the kingdom of Persia. In verse 20, he fights against the, the prince of Persia, against kings of Persia. And when he goes out, the prince of Greece will come. And, and Persia and Greece... Now, Daniel's living in the midst of the Persian Empire. He's been told, though, that the, there is a, another empire that will come. And this fits with that. This fits with the other visions of this book. Uh, Daniel's learned that there, there's going to be empires that succeed one another. One, Babylon, again, he's already lived through that one. Medo-Persia, the one he's in right now. Greece is coming next, and after that, Rome. And then, the kingdom that shall have no end. The kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, what he's learning about is this man, Jesus, comes to him, says, I came in response to your prayer. He says, there are these, there's a spiritual battle going on. These empires that rise and fall, there are spiritual forces behind them. Now of this, we have more revelation. Ephesians 6 tells us to put on the whole armor of God. Why? Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present world. Now, for one, that passage tells us there are cosmic powers over this present world. You can't get around that. There really is spiritual warfare. There really are uh, mighty forces that are unseen to us. These things are going on, and this passage is saying there's, there's some way they're connected to prayer. Now, knowing that about Persia for Daniel does raise a question for us. Is there a prince of the Republic of America, you might say? Is there a malicious spirit that in some way represents the tension within our own nation, a tension uh, uh, against Christ and against his kingdom? Well, if there was one for Persia... And if we are still to put on the armor of God, including praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication for all the saints, should we not expect that there still is some sense of spiritual battle going on, that there still are cosmic powers over this present world? Now, even as I say that, that's, that is alarming. That, that may have been part of what Daniel is responding to. You, you mean to tell me that behind this empire that arose and destroyed Babylon, there's some dark spiritual power? You mean that Babylon, arising as it did to destroy Jerusalem, had the same? Which means in some ways, which in some ways explains how Daniel 
could do as he's been doing. Daniel, through this book, has been serving Nebuchadnezzar. He's, he's served Belshazzar. He's likely serving in the government of Cyrus in some way. Uh, he can do that. Why? Because his battle is not with flesh and blood. Ultimately, Daniel is striving against the evil forces those empires represent. He, that's, that's, that's seen not just in this passage as he's praying, but also when he prayed earlier and, and why he was sent to the lion's den is because he was giving himself to prayer. And any individual, so he, he can serve these individuals. His battle is not with the flesh and blood. It's not necessarily with these individual persons, but against the empires, against the spiritual forces behind them. Uh, that's a reminder that God can at any time save one of them, as he did with Nebuchadnezzar. God can take a Nebuchadnezzar, humble him to eat, like, eat grass, and then bring him to his right mind. So Daniel can at the same time be praying against the spiritual forces behind Persia and all its evil, but he can at the same time be serving them, seeking to pray for their good, pray that they might repent. And so it is with us. Now, friends, it may be easy to fixate on individual politicians or individuals that are in rebellion against God, that have some measure of, of clout or influence in our nation. Friend, are you ever tempted to, to hate our president or hate his administration? Friends, we need to be reminded our battle is spiritual. There, is, there, there, may, there may indeed be evil behind that. But there is a battle in which Christ is fighting. And he is leading us. And we are to take part not by the weapons of the flesh, but by greater weapons that demolish strongholds by putting on the whole armor of God, by taking the sword of the Spirit. And friend, this passage, even if, even if you're still befuddled by it, there's a lot going on here. One thing to take from this is that our prayers matter. Daniel was praying and fasting for three weeks, and so it was 20 days later that Jesus came and said, I came in answer to your prayer. That means that whole spiritual battle that was taking place, Jesus against the prince of Persia, that was taking place as Daniel was wrestling in prayer. So this spiritual battle was going on, Dan and Daniel's prayer was heard. Michael arrived. My friends, we're entering a season where all sorts of people are telling us, get out there and vote. And as important as that is, do you hear the call in this passage to get in there and pray? Jesus Christ is fighting spiritual powers, forces of evil. Let's get in there and pray. That prayer had effect. Now, friends, I, I, I know that's alarming to, to even say that. I suspect many would be alarmed by that because we know how, how much more we would be more intent in our prayers if we did know that, that it ha could have that kind of effect. Would we not give ourselves to seasons of prayer, even weeks as Daniel had prayed, even with much affliction as Daniel prayed, if we, if we knew that that's the ba that, that unseen battle, if that were but seen to us? But have we not been told enough to know that it is going on? Are we being faithful in calling of this battle that we have? So Michael is an answer to this prayer. This man in linen, Jesus coming as a, as, a, as a vision to Daniel, even as traumatic as that one that was, that was an answer to prayer. And there are further answers to prayer in his words, including the, chap the chapters to come. We'll look at those later. But just as a, as a close to this introduction, that there is this comfort given. That Daniel is to be loved and strengthened. Be loved and strengthened. Twice in this passage, he calls Daniel man greatly loved. Of course, that's picking up on last chapter that God told Daniel, you are greatly loved. And so he is that. That is a name for him in this passage. And what a contrast it is then to the name that Daniel had received from one of those kingdoms. Verse 1, remember this is Daniel who was called Belteshazzar. Twice in this passage, he's called by a better name, man greatly loved. 
Friends, how this reminds us that though the kingdoms of this world may malign us, they may call us names that in their eyes put us in our place, God has a name for us that no one else knows. And that has to be enough for us. We need to not let the taunts of of their names for us bear over us. Because just as Daniel outlived Babylon, so the kingdom of Christ will outlive. We need to be so committed to Christ that we, his look of favor, his, his statement of I love you overwhelms any statement that mere man could put on us. And Daniel is greatly loved. And that's part of the complexity of this passage is that the trauma that I've been describing to you, this affliction of of Daniel receiving this revelation is not because Daniel is unloved, but in fact, because he is loved. It is in line with Daniel being loved that God is revealing his holiness to him. Friends, this reminds us that it is, in fact, often because those those who are well-loved are well-loved by God, that they will experience trauma, that they will undergo, in some contexts, discipline, fatherly discipline, those who will know the weight of glory for what it is. And this is because the father disciplines the son whom he loves. It is because of this that blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, blessed are those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. It's part of the, the affliction that we might go through is like that of Daniel, that we, we have the trauma of knowing the holy God and us as sinners. And yet what is our hope in the midst of that? It is like the comfort that Daniel himself received here. Because twice in this vision, this same one who evokes in Daniel this this response of fear, this sense of awe, is the same one who says, fear not. Daniel is trembling. The very one who makes him tremble is comforting him. And so he tells Daniel what Moses told Joshua and what what David told Solomon, this phrase that had been passed on throughout those that God God had had, had given revelation and had had lead the people of God. Uh, It's be strong and courageous. That's for you too, Daniel. You dearly loved ones, you need to be strong and courageous. And and, and I want to remind us that that statement was never a statement to go out and do push-ups. Yes, Daniel, you're in your 80s. Go hit the gym. Be strong and courageous. No, (laughs) that's never what this phrase was about. This phrase has always been a call to be strong in the Lord. To believe. To lay hold of God's strength by trusting Him. So He said, peace to you. He said, be strong and courageous. He's the one who comforted him. And so we also read verse 19, and as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak for you have strengthened me. Friends, the only one who can strengthen us to receive the trauma of God and his holiness, of Christ and his glory is God through Christ, God and Christ themselves. The only one who can save us from God's holiness is God first being being the one who initiates the salvation. God who himself, who makes the way in his son, Jesus Christ. And this then is the wondrous paradox of Christian faith. We serve a God that is so holy, so holy that he is like acid that if you were to reach your hand into, you would be burned away. And yet by faith, we reach to him. We find him who is so holy is the same one who redeems us, is the same one who strengthens us, is the same one who carries us to know him and in knowing him to fear no other. That all the trauma that the empires of this world may want to heap upon us, 
that those things are put in their place. Why? Because we know him. Now, friends, what about you? you you've come to church, and maybe it is your, ha- your habit. You come to church all the time. We have a lot of good events. Have you dealt with Jesus? Do you know him? Has he brought you through that trauma of knowing him by the gospel, by showing you that for every bit of your failings and sins, there is righteousness in Jesus Christ, that every bit of that which should perish in you is overcome by the perfection of Jesus Christ? Do you know him? Because it's not enough to know him superficially. It is not right that we who are called by the name of the triune God should know him in ways that keep us comfortable and our knees never knock and, our, and we, we're, never, uh, we're never driven to the, the ground before his holiness. So if you don't know him in this way, today is the Lord's day. Today is that day Jesus rose from the dead. Today is the day that Jesus is calling you to to do that business which is of most and highest importance, to know him. Do you know that Jesus whose whose face shines like the sun, whose feet are like burnished bronze, who looks at you with eyes like a flame of fire? I'm saying, do you know Jesus and his glory? And if not, today is the day. Knowing is a battle. But it's a battle that is won in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are so much greater than any imitation. You're more, for, far more glorious than any man could comprehend or invent in and of ourselves. You are a living Lord, glorious and mighty. Lord, help us to know you. Cause us to know you. Without your initiative, we are strangers to you. And we would be left with but one-sided and empty Jesuses, idols, things which are false. Lord, thank you that you hear our prayers. Thank you that you have revealed to us, even though we do not know in full detail what is going on, or that you have told us of what is going on above, and you you do hear our prayers. Lord, give us a fervency in this. And Lord, would you meet with us? That we would know your love. That we would know you the living God, through your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.